Hey there, everybody. Um, as much as it looks like I'm really tired, I'm really excited um, to be doing the Dunwich Horror today. Or at least um, part one of the Dunwich Horror. Um, so this is our um, Cthulhu Mythos um, run-through kind of thing. So, um, if you haven't seen any of the other videos, um, I don't think you need to watch them in any particular order, but it's part of a playlist, so, um, just go ahead and click on that. Um, but this story is really, um, kind of, I don't want to say important, it's, it's not like this is an important work, but um, it's got a lot of really interesting uh, bits to it that kind of shaped a lot of things. And this was the first story of Lovecraft's that I like, went gaga over, I guess you can say, where I was just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, kind of deal. Um, but if you're new to Lovecraft, or um, maybe you've read other things Lovecraft has written, but you weren't thrilled about it, this is definitely a good story to try. And it's because this, like right around this time, <clears throat> Lovecraft is doing kind of, uh, I don't want to say like full on experiments, but he is experimenting um, with his own writing. Um, and the Dunwich Horror is a good example of him trying to make his writing a little more pulpy, a little more um, action-driven compared to a lot of his other work. Because um, Lovecraft wrote way more letters, essays, travelogues, um, probably not poetry, but, um, more essays, letters, and travelogues than he ever wrote fiction. Um, and that's why a lot of his fiction, when you read it, it almost comes across as, um, somebody writing like a historical document or reading out of a textbook, um, a lot of the language he uses is very purple, but um, the way in which he lays his words down to paint a picture is um, probably very cold um, compared to, especially compared to writers now, but even compared to writers um, that were his contemporaries during this time. So, um, this one is cool because even though we have this, like, first chapter that is very Lovecraftian in every sense of the word with, um, loads of history and backstory to get you up to speed so when the story starts... Um, you are familiar with the world he's created. Um, there's also a lot of... Oh, and the other thing, too, before I forget. Another thing he did in this more so than probably any other of his, um, like, cosmic horror stuff is... In this first chapter, we're learning about 
the area they're in, and we're learning about the history of the Watleys and the bishops and um, the whole thing. But um, he includes a, um, a like a part of a sermon from the local preacher. And then the preacher goes missing, and a lot of people think that the Watleys are involved in black magic and witchcraft and Satanism, and um, he's he's layering all this stuff in there to make something that is um, more digestible for the public, because especially at this time in the 30s, this was the 30s, right? Yeah, I believe this is 30s. Um, not many people understood cosmic horror. And um, people still don't really understand cosmic horror. But the way he is putting in things that people of the day will understand and be able to relate to, like talking about people being involved with black magic or witchcraft or Satanism. These are all like, ooh, ooh, yes, that's evil stuff. I know about that. And um, that stuff doesn't really filter into his other work. Like this, he was like really trying, I think, to make sure the readers of Weird Tales would, or at least Farnsworth Wright, the editor, would be like... Um, this is very relatable, you know what I'm saying? So, um, so this story has that, which is really cool. Okay, so in this, um, in this episode, um, we're going to go through the first six chapters. And if you haven't read it yet, you could go to weirdmass.com and read the first six chapters of the Dunwich Horror. Um, now... The first chapter, again, is kind of the history and what everyone's thinking. The second chapter is um, we have the birth of Wilbur, um, who is going to be, like, our main focus through this. And um, in the second chapter, we learn about him, we learn about his mother, and we learn about his grandfather. Because um, those are the Watleys that are um, the main focus of that side of the family. And in this story, um, and I'm sure it was, this was something that people could relate to back in this time, especially in New England and that area, that you have um, branches of the family. So, like, with the Watleys, you have the good Watleys, and you have the bad Watleys. And, um, like, now, like, my family has kind of that same thing, but it's not, like, the good and the bad. It's just, like, the people we don't talk to or ever speak about. <laughs> um, so, but I'm sure, like, in smaller communities, um, the distinction between two groups of a family, um, like that would be like a bigger deal. Um, so we have all that. And, um, during this time too, um, the Watleys, the bad Watleys are, um, getting a lot of cattle Everyone knows that they're buying a lot of cattle, but they don't see a lot of cattle on their property. And Baby Wilbur, like, they know the father left, um, so it's like a single mom kind of thing. And um, the growing of Wilbur is kind of crazy, and like... He's walking at seven months old, and he's talking at 11 months old. But uh, this has also that um, a lot of Lovecraft tropes 
especially with the New England area. Like, you have these weird little rural areas in New England, and there's a lot of speculation of inbreeding, and people, when they're, like, ashamed of the town and all this stuff, they take the signs down so no one could find the town. And, um, when you go there, there'll be, like, a a big burnt out area where nothing grows. Like this just happened in color out of space. Like this is this, the inbreeding, um, the, the burnt land, like all of this stuff is, um, things that Lovecraft goes to over and over again. And, um, we hear about, um, Yog sothoth in this, which is funny because, August Derleth, who started Arkham House and basically put out all of Lovecraft's work after his death, really coined the Cthulhu mythos. And Lovecraft, I guess this was something that came up in conversation, but um, Lovecraft always called it um, Yog Sothosism. Yog Sothothism. Like, he probably would have never put as much emphasis on Cthulhu as everyone else did after he died. So that's just one of those, like, oh, that's interesting. So when we get to chapter three, okay, he's like a year and seven months old, Wilbur is, and he looks like a top, like four, like four or five years old. The farmhouse they have on the property, like the upper floor has been completely boarded up, but there's this big door that they put on it that everyone was like, why is there a door there that just opens up to nowhere? Well, then they made this ramp, this long ramp that goes up to this big door um, on the side of the house. So everyone's like, what's going on? But then at the same time, they're ordering more cattle and buying more cattle. And um, people just aren't connecting the dots here. And the bottom floor of the house they basically turned into Wilbur's study so he could, like, learn, um, like, homeschool kind of thing. But um, the Watley family, um, the, one of the things that really broke the family up into two different groups was that Wilbur's great-grandfather, I think was known as Wizard Watley, and he had all these books, um, sacred tomes, and all this stuff. So the study's full of all these books that um, young little Wilbur is going to be reading. When he finally hits four years old, now he looks like he's ten years old. So he's just growing and getting bigger and the whole deal. And the people in Dunwich like hear strange noises at night and there's earthquakes and um, weird stuff. And then there's this hill that has like this um, almost like a sacrificial stone altar on it. And um, people say that like on certain times of the year they see um, it's really windy. Sorry. I guess I'm calling upon the Yog Sothoth. Um, they see Wilbur and his mom, like, running up there naked um, to do whatever the hell it is they do. Dogs don't like Wilbur at all. So keep that in mind because that comes into play later. Spoiler. Um, so when we get into Chapter 4, we get to the death of the grandfather. Wilbur is about 10 years old now. And he's like 6 feet tall. Okay. And the grandpa's dying. And he's like telling Wilbur. He's like you gotta. You know you gotta find the book. You gotta you know get page 751. And um, you know. Yog sothoth And saying all this stuff. And he's like and don't remember. And remember to. Um, to always feed him, and, da, 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 da. and he's just like saying all this like crazy stuff. And then when um, 
the grandpa dies instead of like crying Wilbur chuckles um, because the whippoorwills didn't get him. When, when you talk like Wilbur, you get a weird voice, even though he's like a kid. So it's like that whole thing's just weird. So through this time, um, the mom is never seen again. And that's like a big, like, what the hell, where is she? But everyone knows enough to just stay the hell away from the Wadley farm. So, like, it's just weird crap happens. What you gonna do? Now, chapter five is where everything starts really picking up. And chapter five, Wilbur has decided he could no longer wait. And he has to actually leave the town of Dunwich to go to Miskatonic University and try to see a different translation of the Necronomicon because he does have a copy of the Necronomicon but his is a really shit English translation and he needs the Latin so um, he goes to this um, university looking for it he's fucking eight feet tall now okay um, and he is very goatish looking and just like horrific and he stinks so imagine this, like, monstrous eight-foot-tall dude who is really not even a teenager yet, like, lumbering into this, like, quiet library and then wanting to see, like, the most terrifying book of all time. Like, what do you do if you're a librarian? Um, so... He gets the book, he goes to page 751, and he's, like, taking notes and stuff. And Professor Armitage, who was there, um, who got the book out for him, was kind of, like, looking over his shoulder. And this is one of the first times we get, like, a big chunk out of um, things that the Necronomicon says. <clears throat> so that's super interesting and fun. Um, but Wilbur's finally, like... I'm not going to be able to complete this here. Um, I'm going to need to take this book. And Armitage is like, uh, no. And honestly, he probably would have let him take it, but something inside him was like, okay, he's terrifying. The Necronomicon is terrifying. He wants this really bad. Something really bad will happen if you let this happen. <clears throat> So, through that, and, like, I'm like, okay, Wilbur's gonna lose his shit and just, like, kill him, right? No, Wilbur's like, alright, cool, I'm gonna mosey on out of here. And, um, Armitage is so, like, certain that Wilbur is up to no good. He contacts every university that he knows that has a copy of the Necronomicon, which isn't many. I think there was only, like, Harvard and Buenos Aires, and there might be one other place that has it, and warns them, do not let this guy take it, because I don't know what he's up to, but just trust me, don't do it. So, now we're in Chapter 6. And Wilbur is probably pretty pissed because he's probably tried to get the Necronomicon and <clears throat> hasn't been able to get it. So um, Armitage is feeling pretty good about himself that he was able to thwart the onslaught of chaos um, when this alarm goes off and all these people are like running towards the library and he's like, oh no. And so he runs off to the library and um, there's like a dog baying and um, whimpering and stuff. He gets in the library, and this is when everything gets fucking terrifying. He goes in, and there's this like practically naked body on the table, which is like over nine feet tall. Um, there's a dog laying on its chest. Its clothes are all ripped off or whatever. Um, 
but like it's this goatish faced man but his skin is all scaly like a crocodile and then in his hips he has these big giant eyes and he's all hairy down here but then he's got all these big tentacles that are like pulsating and like changing color as he breathes oh and instead of blood um he's like seeping this like greenish yellowish ichor okay so um this is terrifying and obviously it's wilbur um the dog's on top of him so basically and um there's a gun and so like it's like what the hell what happened here so apparently the gun misfired and this dog attacked wilbur when wilbur was trying to break into the library or broke into the library so, um, one would think now that the Necronomicon safe and Wilbur Watley or whatever we thought was Wilbur Watley is dead, that everything's going to be cool now, but it's not. And as Wilbur Watley lays there dying, he's like, bada, 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 yog, so, tha, tha, bada, 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 doing all this stuff. And nobody knows what he's doing but everyone knows something's a foot or a tentacle um so anyway so that's the first bit of the dunwich horror now many of you might say wow mr paperback junkie if only lovecraft would tell stories as exciting as you tell them maybe they'd be funner to read I agree with you wholeheartedly, but then they wouldn't be Lovecraft stories. Um, yeah, so Lovecraft has a very specific way he tells a story, and it is to some people's liking, and some people don't like it at all. So I know Lovecraft is a very acquired taste, and judging by the views on my Lovecraft videos, um, that is a very safe assumption to make. Um, but you can't take anything away from his contribution to the genre and to um, pulp fiction in general. So, um, and this story is so good, and the imagery is so just bizarre and amazing. Like, if you didn't have Lovecraft, you wouldn't have the thing. You wouldn't have, um, I, I'm kind of going off on this half-cocked, but so much of Stephen King you wouldn't have. Um, I mean, obviously the whole Lovecraft circle would be non-existent. Um, a lot of the sci-fi writers from the 50s and 60s who cut their teeth on um, writing pulp horror in the 30s, we wouldn't have. Um, there's just so much stuff that Lovecraft's tentacles have touched. Um, but this is, like, this is one of Lovecraft's really good stories. Um, and I'm one of those people who are not a huge fan of a lot of the things that most Lovecraft fans are a fan of. Like, I think Call of Cthulhu is um, borderline at best. Um, and a lot of people who really love Lovecraft, even though this Dunwich Horror is really a popular story, a lot of people don't like it for the same reasons why I do like it, um, with how accessible it is and how, um, pulpy it is. So, um, I don't know, like, what do you guys think? Do you, is Dunwich Horror one of your favorites? How do you view Lovecraft's more pulpy works? Um, are you a fan of the Cthulhu stories in general, or do you lean more towards his Dream Cycle stuff? Or do you lean more to his, like, Poe stuff? Because his Poe stuff, 
was like really the first thing that I fell in love with with him. Um, but the Dunwich Horror was the first kind of cosmic y um, story of his that I like went head over heels for. So, um, I don't know. Let me know down below. This is a really fun story. I really hope everybody's going to read it. This is just, it's fun. So, I will see you guys later. Bye bye.